Good morning. Today's announcement are for a week beginning the 8th of September and the service you will be watching is from Sunday the 1st of September. On Monday the 9th of September, Tots & Co starts back from 10am to 12 in the lower hall. Monday the 9th of September, Kirk Session will meet at 7.30pm in the lower committee room. On Tuesday the 10th of September, GB meets at the usual times. And on Wednesday, the 11th of September, the Friendship Club will meet at 2.30pm in the Lower Hall. Next Sunday, the 15th of September, will be the RAF Battle of Britain Remembrance Service, and this will be led by the Reverend Dr Michael Barry. These are all the announcements. Good evening. Welcome to the evening service. Then advance notice for the history group. They're going to the Ulster Folk Museum on Thursday the 19th of September. Cars leave Joymont at 10.30. Cost £9 per person or £8.10 if we get enough coming along. Uh, speak to Jim Bodles or Billy McCartney by Tuesday week if you're interested in coming. Next day of prayer is on Saturday coming. As usual, it'll be in the prayer room at midnight on Friday through to Saturday midnight. There are still one or two places left on the rota. Now, there's a change to what has been announced about the morning service on the 15th of September. There will now be the uh, RAF Battle of Britain service on that morning. We had previously thought we might be out in the hall by then because the work had started in the church, but that's not the case. We know it won't start now until the end of the month. So uh, 15th of September, there will be the usual annual RAF service here, and that will be led by the very Reverend Dr Michael Barry. Uh, that's all the announcements. There will be a retiring offering. We won't pass the plates around. Good evening. Good to see you. Uh, I'm focusing on unity tonight. Unity in the church, unity in the cross. Um, I suppose one of the reasons for that is I'm very aware I've been part of church fellowships, two church fellowships where they've had major renovations going on. And there's quite an upheaval to that. We've heard a wee bit about that here. We have to be very fluid. Uh, we have to realise that we won't have our same seat each week, week in, week out, when we go to worship in the hall. And when we return here, things will be different. And the unity of church in the church the love that we have for God and for one another is absolutely crucial in that. So that's one of the reasons why I've picked a passage from 1 Corinthians. In fact, looking at 1 Corinthians in a big, big sweep here tonight, speaking about unity in the body of Christ in the cross. So let's just still our hearts tonight. Let's bow our heads together and seek the Lord as we come to worship him. The psalmist declares, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol his name with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Heavenly Father, we align our hearts with yours, O Lord. We pray for the strength of your Holy Spirit to anoint us to worship you here this evening. We ask your blessing upon Raymond as he would lead us. And we pray, Father, that the worship that we bring to you would rise up as a pleasing aroma. Bring glory to your holy name. 
through Christ your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and worship God. The words will be on the screen. Uh, hymn 236, Sing to God New Songs of Worship. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Loving and almighty God, we thank you that you have called us together in this place as part of your great family of people throughout the world. We praise you for the bond that we have that you have given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that we gather here as friends in fellowship with you and with one another and as part of the great company of your people in every time and in every place. We praise you, O Lord, that through Jesus Christ, your Son, we have become a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, your own people, called to proclaim your mighty deeds in leading us out of darkness and into light. Once we were no people at all, but you have called us to be the people of God, chosen and precious to you. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received your mercy in all its wonder. We praise you for your awesome love. So great that while we were still sinners, you gave your son for us. We praise you for your limitless patience with us always forgiving despite our failure to serve you as we should. We praise you for your constant care, watching over us as a father watches over his children. And so, Father God, we proclaim, we cry aloud that it is through one faith that we have gathered in Christ. And we ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, would bind us together in love. Help us to call you our Father, not just in name, but in truth. 
to be obedient to you. To seek your face and to seek your guidance. To accept your discipline. And to trust your judgment. Help us to learn what it means to be your people. To appreciate just how wide and high and how deep and great is the extent of your love. And teach us to show that same love and care in all our dealings with one another. We meet together again this evening, O Lord, as your people. May we be encouraged through being with you and being with one another. So may your family in this church and all represented here in this town and every place grow and flourish to the glory of your holy name. In that one faith that we all share, that binds us together in love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I encourage you to pick up a pew Bible, or if you've got your own Bible with you, even better. Uh, we're going to turn to Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. You'll find it on page 1144 of your pew Bible. And we're going to read the first nine verses. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. Let us hear the word of God. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ their Lord and ours grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always give thanks, give, I always thank God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eager, eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Amen. And thanks be to God for his holy and inspired. Let's stand once more this time through the words of hymn 526. Saviour, teach me day by day.
boys, you'd hear that hymn is just feels so familiar. Uh, I don't know what it was. It was probably school assemblies in Belfast High School or somewhere like that. Uh, uh, I was sharing with some people this afternoon. I had an invite to go to the Church of Ireland in Green Island, Station Road, Green Island, called Church of the Holy Name. That's where we worshipped as a family years and years ago. I haven't been in through the door in 45 years. And I was invited in there today as they celebrated 70 years of their existence. And it was just things that really triggered memories for me. Uh, the brick walls, I touched them with my hand like it was a child again. And it just made memories flood back. Me sitting in a pew, there's seven chairs in a row. We filled six of them when we came in as a family. And, and for me, all I could think of, and I get really sort of emotional about this, when my mum and dad sit beside us at the time we were now gone to be with the Lord six years or more. But it was just very simple things. It's weird what triggers, you know, memories and emotion in you, isn't it? I think one of the most evocative ones that I've ever experienced was coming back from Uganda and about two or three months later, I pulled out an envelope with all our travel in travel documents and there was a smell of Uganda came out of the and smells, aromas are very evocative. If you've ever been in Africa, it's the smell of burning wood because that's how they heat their homes, how they cook things as well. We're going to return back into 1 Corinthians for our second reading. We're going to carry on from verse 10 and read through to the end of verse 17. This microphone's Echoing like mad, there's a wee bit of ring back on it. Do you, are you hear that? Yeah, it's quite off putting, isn't it? it? It needs a wee bit of a tweak. I think that's just going now. Can you still hear me? Yep. Brilliant. So we're picking up from verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 1. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word. Let's stand once more. You're getting a wee bit of exercise tonight. And we're going to sing the words of hymn 549. Lord of creation, to you be all, all praise. <laughs>
wish you could hear you folks sing together. You're probably thinking, God oh, bless me, there's not too much. It's absolutely stunning at the front of the church. It's beautiful, really beautiful. Uh, turn with me to that passage from 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at this passage with the idea of unity in the cross. I'm sure it's come across to you in the, the two readings we, we, we gave there that uh, this is the focus of this passage here. But before we do that, let's pray. Father God, help us by your Spirit to understand, to comprehend. Challenge us, Lord God, and build us up in Christ Jesus that we may be one in him and in his cross. For the glory of your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, business uh, researchers call it the missing ingredient or the hidden accelerator. Most managers could transform their workplaces with this missing ingredient. What do you think it is? Encouragement. Showing appreciation. That's the focus of a book entitled The Carrot Principle, written by Adrian Gostick and Chester Elton. Some of the statistics to back up their claims include this, of the people who re report high morale at work, 94.4% agree that their managers show appreciation. 79% of employees who quit their jobs cite a lack of appreciation as the key reason for leaving. And 56% of employees who report low morale also give their managers low marks for showing appreciation and giving words of encouragement. Of course, these statistics tap into a fundamental need in all of our relationships. The need to give and receive encouragement, affirmation and blessing. I, I, I've learned a huge lesson over the last number of years having a dog. The dog doesn't respond if you beat it. Now I haven't beaten my dog. I was told to stay away from ever beating my dog. I was always told if you're going to chastise a dog, chastise it indirectly. So it never knows that you're doing it. But what it does respond to is encouragement. Oh, you're a good girl. What a lovely girl. You're a good girl. Now, I can see you all smiling, beginning to break out into smiles. It rubs off, doesn't it? Even though I'm acting an idiot at the front, going, Fuck oh, you, cutie. Wee. You're just my best wee girl. But it rubs off, and it doesn't just rub off to the person who is getting appreciation. Or encouragement, it rubs off people all around as well. The need to give and receive encouragement, affirmation and blessing is essential. The authors of the carrot principle conclude the simple act of a leader or a spouse or a parent or a friend or a coach or a mentor, a youth leader, a minister, elder, or other church member expressing appreciation to a person is the missing accelerator that can do so much but is used oh so sparingly. Now, I don't know whether you have noticed when I come into the pulpit on a Sunday morning I'm trying not to put a false smile on but I'm trying to come in with a smile on my face every Sunday. And when I arrive in here at 10 p.m., uh, 10 p.m., 10 a.m., uh, we're on a time warp here. It's been a busy day. Uh, I try to encourage people. I try to have a laugh with people. I think, I think over the years, particularly within the Presbyterian denomination, we're very serious. We're very dour. And do you know something? There's a time to be serious and there's a time to be doer. 
But God created us in all our fullness. He caused us, created us to laugh. The Christians in Corinth were struggling with the environment where they did life. They were living in the richest and most cosmopolitan city in all ancient Greece. It is, was also the most corrupt, where everything and anything goes. It was the center of, for trade. It had been invaded by all kinds of religions and philosophies. And surrounded by the corruption and every conceivable sin, they felt pressurized to adapt, to morph, to allow the world to influence the church and its standards. Does it sound familiar? The believers knew that they were free in Christ, but what did this freedom mean? How should they view idols and sexuality? What should they do about marriage? What should they do about certain people within the church and the gifts of the Spirit? These were more than theoretical questions or questions they threatened to undermine the very church through the subtle invasion of immorality and spiritual immaturity. The faith of the believers was being tested in the crucible of worldly immorality and some of them were starting to sink and slide into it. The Apostle Paul founded this church in Corinth during his second missionary journey. And having done so, he ministered there for 18 months before moving on. However, news had reached his ears that the church was divided through difference in opinion and interpretation of what was right and what was wrong. And a delegation from Corinth has now arrived in Ephesus seeking Paul's help regarding certain questions. First Corinthians is his response. Even though believers are all one in Christ, the local church often suffers from divisions. I always wonder, do you ever wonder why it always seems to be the Protestant denominations that split? You know, I've just heard, Leslie and I were up at our house on Thursday. We have a wee house up in North Andrum. Uh, and we were coming down and we met somebody we knew and uh, we'd heard about a church split in Ballymoney and they've set up another church about clock mills. What's that all about? You know, I, I, I struggle to get my head around how, you know, two pastors in one church, one a senior pastor, one, you know, a junior pastor, there's a disagreement. And how can one of them go and set up their own independent church? I, I, you know, I struggle with that. The importance of all these things is that we're one in Christ. And the local church often suffers from division, but rather than thinking this letter is negative, it is Paul's intention to point us all back to what is at the core of our faith in Christ. The one thing that truly matters to each and every one of us is the cross. For it is there that neither status nor position, wealth or fame, knowledge or lack of knowledge, the ground is level for everyone at the foot of the cross and it's there where we are truly united in Christ. Let me ask you another question. Oh no, he's going to ask questions. He's looking for a response. What's the purpose of the church? Do you want me to tell you? Or do you want to give you one view on the purpose of the church? The biblical answer to that question deals not with what the church does for you. 
about what the church does for God. If you've ever heard Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller, he does uh, a lovely thing on YouTube, put in uh, uh, Tim Keller, what's church all about? Or what it's all about, put that in. You see, he, he talks about the Bible. What's the Bible all about? And his final line is, it's not about you. It's all about Jesus. And it's always been about Jesus. When we begin to understand this, we turn the corner from a compromised, self-centered involvement in the church to the God-centered communal way of life that God calls and uses for his own purposes. We're going down the wrong track if we think it's all about us. That's where divisions begin because we're all going to have different views. It's all about God. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Once we understand this, the, the Christian life becomes a lot more than a simple, sustained moral effort to cultivate a list of private virtues and avoid a list of private vices. We begin to understand that we, the church, are called to manifest the life of Christ. We come to grow, to go for Jesus. We come to Jesus, to grow in Jesus, to go for Jesus. And the reason why Jesus is not three times is because it's all about him. It's all about his church. When we take part in this manifestation, things begin to change, not just within us, but in our homes, in our towns, in our friendships, in our workplaces, in our cities, and we begin to fulfill our first calling to go and to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and to subdue it using all its vast resources in the service of God. The point of Paul's letter is to teach us that we're supposed to be like what we're, is to teach us what we're supposed to be like and why the church is supposed to be that way. So first of all, what's the church to be like? We clearly see from our reading here, or from reading Paul, Paul's letter to Corinthians, that we, the church, are to be holy. Paul greets the church in Corinth as those called to be holy, an inevitable part of holiness is to possess a certain kind of strangeness. Did you know you're strange? You're unique. You don't believe me, do you? Have you ever been in a situation, because you're a Christian and people know that you're a Christian, that you feel a wee bit out of it? That's what I mean by strangeness. It's, it's like me in my workplace going away to you and somebody says, oh, you'll not want to come, you're good living. That's actually an honour. That's an excellent honour that people actually notice that you're different. That you're being slagged off, maybe in some subtle way, for being a follower of the Lord Jesus. An inevitable part of holiness is to possess a certain kind of strangeness. It was like this way in the Old and the New Testaments. So what should be for us today, holiness is strangeness to the world. We are strange because we have been set apart and made special by God. That's what holiness means, set apart. It's one of the parts of holiness. A chameleon's skin turns green on the grass, on soil it turns brown, 
The chameleon changes to match its environment. Many creatures blend into nature with God-given camouflage to suit their environment. But in contrast, Christians are new creations, born not of flesh and blood, but from above by the Spirit of God, transformed from within with new values and changed lifestyles that stand out in the crowd and confront the world. And what it values. Drew Gibson, who was our practical theology professor, uh, used to give a definition, and I think you've probably heard me say it, that mission, one form of mission, is that we're salt and light in the world. That we affirm the things that our governments pass and the laws that conform to the word of God, those things that are go against it, that we stand out and say, hey, no, we write your MP. We just don't take it. In one way, this is what's happening in the church in Corinth. The world is saying this is the way that you should live. And it's getting right into the church. We've already seen it within the church. And I just don't mean PCI. I mean the church of Jesus Christ. There's now same-sex marriage and blessings being done within the church. We have actually had a minister ordained in a same-sex relationship, who's married, ordained here in Carrick Fergus. Because the church is holy, she must be pure. 1 Corinthians 5 is one of the classic statements on the purity of the church. The disciplinary actions taken in this chapter are all about holiness. A man in the church had married his stepmother. In chapter 5, verse 5, Paul says, Hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature, the flesh, may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Paul is concerned about the church's tolerance. So in chapter 5, verse 6, Paul warns them, Do not... Do you not know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Paul is saying sin spreads, so you must be very careful about leaving sin present in the church. Deal with it. I know discipline is a big thing, and we don't get discipline right all that often in the church. Paul is saying sin spreads. We must be very careful about leaving sin present in the church. To do that carries with it consequences. God has always wanted his people to be holy. Paul is not saying that church consigns people to hell. He didn't say that. The whole process of discipline is meant to be a warning to people. It's actually meant to help them avert condemnation by awakening them to their dire condition. The church is to be marked out. We're meant to stand out by holiness. It should be our trademark, so to speak. When someone thinks of the church there, to think, this is some holy community. So holiness is a major topic in this unity of the cross. Uh, We're we're made holy by Christ's sacrifice upon the cross. Uh, We're we're ushered into a lifestyle of holiness in Christ. Secondly, the church is called to be united. It's obvious when you read 1 Corinthians that the church was having a problem with unity. And it's not surprising Because once you begin to tolerate sin, you begin to have a problem with unity. Let's be clear. Let's let's get something very clear here. We all sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us has sinned. The crucial issue is this. When confronted with those sins, 
Do we want to repent? The church in Corinth was tolerating people who knew they were sinning and they did nothing about it. Some people in the church in Corinth were truly Christians. They wanted to be holy and bring glory and honour to God with their lives, but there were others who wanted other things. The two groups were separating from each other because of the increased level of division. Paul speaks sternly in chapter 3, verse 3. You're still worldly, he says, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you. Do you see the selfishness in this? For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere human beings, he says. It's really interesting when you go to the introduction or the prologues, the first words of any of Paul's letters, he always gives a hint or two what is to come in the rest of the letter. In verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we the church are to be holy, we're to be one, we're to be united in this one thing in Christ Jesus. Now in verse 9, Paul writes, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his Son. Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Passion Translation puts it like this. God is forever faithful and can be trusted to do this in you. For he has invited you to co-share the life of his son, Jesus the Anointed One. Or a life of communion with his son. A co-participation, a common union of his son. We see a clear picture here that believers are called to share in and be united through the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we the church are to love one another. Sufficient to say that Paul dedicates a whole chapter to the topic of love before he concludes this letter. Why is that? Well, it's because love is the central characteristic of who God is and therefore who we should be in Christ Jesus. God is spirit. God is love. God is the source of all love. But you didn't, well, do you realise the love that you have for some person, the love that I even have for my wee dog, love that I have for my wife, for my children, for this congregation of Joymount, its source is God. I'm sure we've heard it say, love is not a feeling, it is an action, and therefore each one of us faces a choice to love or not to love. The Lord's revolutionary love says, love your neighbour, love your enemy. But first and foremost, we are called to love God with all of our heart, and to love our neighbour, those sitting beside us in the pews, those that we rub shoulders with each and every day. And so in conclusion, we the church are to reflect the character of God. Why is the church supposed to be a people of holiness, unity, and a loving, have a loving nature? Paul stresses these characteristics because the characteristic character of the church is supposed to reflect the character of God. We do get it wrong. We're to be holy. We're to be united and loving because God is all of these things. In Corinthians 11, 
uh, verse 1, Paul writes this, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. We are holy not simply so we can have a morally healthy society, but to reflect God's holiness. We're not to focus on life being about us. We focus on life being about God. As God is loving, we are loving. If we're going to be his, we will have to be strange to the world and familiar to him. Familiar to Jesus. That's what it means to be united in the cross. To be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment to pray. I'm going to give you a wee, wee bit of time just to think. and Whatever the Lord has challenged you with here tonight. In this passage about being united in Christ. Being united in the cross. Heavenly Father, we pray for those churches, far too many, which have experienced division among themselves. And Father, if we're honest, really truly honest, we have known that division within these walls too. Now we split apart over issues of doctrine, of worship, possibly authority. I don't know, Lord God, but you know. Father, forgive us. Forgive us that all that, of all those things that denies our uni unity in Christ. We pray for those whose faith has been undermined by a word said or a dispute. Who feel hurt or let down by what has taken place. Father God, even today in Green Island, I was speaking to somebody that I knew 45 years ago who spoke of a person we knew who was heavily involved in the church, who had had a disagreement with the vicar, and who never darkened the door of the church again. Father God, we pray for such situations. Forgive us, Lord, if we have been the source of such disagreements. Father, bless those who have been hurt by words we have maybe said. We pray for those outside the church who have witnessed such division, those who have been put off by what they have seen, seeing it as an argument against the truth of the gospel, a contradiction of everything we proclaim about you. May they see, Lord God, that as we focus our eyes on Jesus, that we love you with all our heart, mind, soul and strength, and that we love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Unite us, O oh Lord. Unite your church in every place, drawing together those of different denominations, temperaments, outlooks, traditions, all races, Lord God. May there be a respect between all, a willingness to work together, and a sense of unity that speaks beyond all those differences and focuses only on our commonality, our union with Christ Jesus. Forgive us, O Lord, in this precious name we pray. Amen. Now at the end of this service, I'll say the benediction and you're free to leave. If you want to leave, there'll be a, a prayer, a prayers of divine healing here at the front of the service. So please remain if you want a prayer for a loved one. I've got your cards as well here. We will pray through. Uh, the names that are on these cards. So let's uh, stand and close our service with the day you gave us, Lord, as ended.
May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.